to talk about uh, vigilantes in the American West. Um, in a way, this should have followed PJ's uh, discussion of uh, governance in the West, uh, uh, because a lot of the background for this actually would come from what he has to say. Uh, so I'll probably just say, well, if you have questions, ask PJ after his discussion. Uh, the, uh, uh, my argument today is going to be that uh, vigilantes in the American West were uh, private or community responses to government failure uh, in uh, law enforcement. Um, now, if you look in the dictionary to see what vigilantes are, it's going to say something like uh, uh, that first quote, which uh, actually is from a dictionary. It says, someone who takes the law into his, her own hands uh, by trying and or punishing another person without any legal authority. Um, and uh, then it goes on, if it's an adjective, it means done violently and summarily. Um, that does not describe uh, most vigilante movements in the American West. The, the word vigilante uh, comes from Spanish and Latin before that, which simply means vigilance, being watchful, uh, protecting your, your stuff. Um, Government uh, uh, officials, of course, aren't very happy with vigilante kinds of movements. Um, the, uh, uh, and, and this definition has uh, sort of worked its way into uh, our language now so that we don't think about what the word actually uh, used to mean. Now it con uh, connotes uh, violence and um, you know, hanging people, which some of them did. Um, but if you think about what we all think about, uh, it, it, these, these were all vigilantes. Uh, they took the law into their own hands, and yet they're, uh, you may not know some of them because they were on TV when I was a kid. <laughs> you, you may not have seen the Lone Ranger or uh, Zorro, but uh, uh, they uh, were uh, the good guys in these uh, films uh, and TV shows. And uh, for the most part in the American West, they were the good guys. Uh, the assumption underlying that uh, current definition of vigilantes is uh, the, uh, uh, that, uh, uh, of course, taking the law into your own hands is illegal. Uh, it, you, People should not be doing that. They're committing crimes themselves. The problem is, of course, if nobody's enforcing the law uh, anyway, then taking the law into your own hands in order to try to enforce the law is actually uh, an effort to create order. Um, but today's word, uh, just really think, you think of violence and you think of lynch mobs and things like that, and they all sort of get described as vigilantes. Um, I'm going to uh, stick with the sort of original meaning of the word, and I am going to argue that uh, most of the vigilante activity in the West uh, was um, to resolve government failure. Now, uh, one uh, issue that uh, we have to recognize uh, and that PJ will probably talk about uh, is the fact that people moved west much more rapidly um, than the government institutions moved west. Uh, so uh, law still existed in the sense of rules being applied and enforced, uh, but without the typical institutions of government that we think about. Uh, groups joined together to establish rules uh, and um, to enforce those rules. And, and PJ will probably talk about some subset of mining camps and wagon trains and uh, land clubs, cattlemen's associations, and so on. Um, 
the uh, government, of course, uh, did catch up, ultimately. Um, but a lot of times, uh, the government that did catch up um, turned out to be uh, incapable um, of doing uh, what the community wanted it to do in terms of uh, protection and, and provision of order. Or it turned out to be so corrupt that uh, it was actually outside the law, if you want to think of it in that way. So the resulting governments early on in the West were very uh, ineffective, generally, uh, if not just outright uh, criminal uh, themselves. And so in many cases, um, that previous tradition that PJ will talk about of, of groups coming together to create and enforce their own rules uh, would then spring back up. Uh, it was right there in their immediate memories, and they would uh, uh, take the law back into their own hands, uh, away from that uh, new and ineffective government. Um, and to illustrate that, I just want to look at a couple of examples. Uh, the most well-known is, uh, uh, two, uh, in fact, the two most well-known occurred in uh, San Francisco, uh, one in 1851 and then the next one in 1856. Um, the uh, uh, San Francisco was kind of a sleepy little town before the gold rush. Um, it had been established long enough so that it did have a local government. It had... Uh, a police uh, force, actually, a sheriff uh, and uh, deputies, and um, it had a court that met uh, every couple of months. And, and so there was a legal apparatus uh, to enforce rules there. Uh, not a lot of uh, uh, criminal activity, of course. But then gold is discovered, um, and people just started pouring into California. Uh, many of them through San Francisco. And uh, San Francisco grew dramatically. Um, it, uh, uh, the, the law enforcement apparatus just couldn't handle it. It just grew so fast and the amount of crime increased so dramatically. Um, uh, if, uh, if they managed to catch some of the criminals, they usually got away. They usually escaped because the jail was inadequate. And, um, and so uh, the uh, city press, uh, there were several newspapers at the time, um, uh, started calling for more drastic action. We, we need to uh, get, uh, take control of the city and, and reestablish law and order. Um, and that started in as early as 1849, which was the first year of the gold rush. Uh, the real influx of people uh, didn't occur until uh, the next year. Um, the uh, actual impetus for uh, organization, I would say, the, the event that uh, stimulated uh, an actual effort to organize a vigilance committee occurred um, when the owner of a clothing store was robbed and in the process of being robbed, he was, he was also beaten. Um, the uh, uh, sheriff uh, arrived um, and did arrest the uh, two men that were involved and charged them. Um, but uh, the citizens didn't expect anything to happen to these guys. They, the expectation was uh, that they wouldn't, there wasn't room in the jail, they wouldn't hold them effectively, and, and they wouldn't be, even be there when the trial started. So a number of people gathered um, at the city offices and demanded quick action. They wanted uh, quick action before these guys could escape or get away. Um, the, uh, uh, they formed a, a committee of 14 people, very prominent citizens in the community uh, to take charge of the case. They invited the government officials to uh, participate as well, um, <clears throat> they, but uh, they didn't uh, 
agreed to do that, although they didn't resist uh, uh, handing the prisoners over to this committee. Uh, they formed a, a jury, um, a, appointed a, a judge. Um, they uh, also appointed, as you can see the quote, two uh, highly regarded lawyers to represent the prisoners. Um, the, uh, they ran the trial. The jury, after hearing the case, voted nine to uh, uh, three for acquittal. Uh, uh, nine to th guilty and three for acquittal. Um, the crowd, the lynch mob at, uh, crowd, sort of, uh, demanded punishment, but the committee refused. They said, uh, jury has to be unanimous for guilt or we're not going to punish them. Uh, and they uh, uh, gave them back to the uh, public authorities. Uh, but that formation of that committee stimulated then a, a, a widespread um, discussion of uh, uh, individual small groups and, and um, ultimately uh, the uh, formation of a, a larger, well, about 3,000 citizens gathered. Um, uh, at this uh, trial for a, an arsonist, if, if you know anything about San Francisco's here, uh, history, you know that fires were devastating because everything was really jammed together and it was all made of uh, wood and so on. So they uh, were really concerned about arson. Um, and uh, the, uh, then uh, after that trial, um, various small groups just started meeting getting together to discuss the possibility of, of the Vigilance Committee. Um, ultimately, after several more days, they uh, uh, came together and chose a, a group of uh, individuals to uh, uh, form a committee uh, of vigilance, uh, which they did in uh, June of that year. Um, the first thing they did uh, was um, they uh, caught an individual, uh, John Jenkins, in the act of stealing a safe from a business office. Um, the, uh, there were a couple of vigilante members uh, with the sheriff, uh, sheriff's officers uh, when they were arrested. And so they took the prisoners to the committee's headquarters rather than the sheriff's office. Um, a trial similar to the one that I talked about before was was quickly organized, but in this case the guy got caught in the act, so it wasn't there wasn't much question about uh, guilt or innocence, and he was convicted, um, and the verdict was hang, handed down, um, he was to be hanged. Uh, that was the standard punishment for such things uh, at the time and and place, and so. This would not have been uh, different than the, what the government would have done had they um, completed a successful trial. Um, then on uh, June thirteenth, they issued uh, the committee issued a statement, uh, public statement about what they were about, uh, essentially uh, saying they uh, uh, were. Uh, going to restore order in the community um, and all the members of the committee put their names in the paper following that statement so there was uh, it certainly wasn't a secret society or anything like that um, and the uh, uh, it, it ran in in the paper and and after that um, they organized a number of vigilance activities that is efforts to prevent crime. Uh, so they didn't re just wait to respond and hang people. Uh, they were trying to prevent crime. Uh, a, a big source of, of criminals in California at the time was from uh, Aus Australia. Uh, if you know uh, anything about English legal history, you know that uh, the uh, English sent criminals first to the American colonies, but the American Revolution messed that up, so they then started sending them to Australia. And the earliest uh, large groups of people in Australia were criminals. Uh, well, if they could get on a boat and come to California, uh, 
that was an attractive thing to do because there was lots of gold to steal. Uh, so uh, you start getting an influx of people from uh, uh, the Australian uh, criminal uh, colonies or com uh, communities or whatever you want to call them. Um, and so the vigilance or vigilante committee started meeting the boats coming in from Australia, uh, look at, examining the uh, uh, papers that the individuals had. If they didn't have a permit to land that was issued by the U.S. Council uh, in, in Australia, then they weren't allowed to get off the boat. Uh, they just uh, told them to go back home or uh, they couldn't come into San Francisco at any rate. Uh, but uh, if they couldn't pay their way back, uh, the committee actually would pay uh, to transport them back to Australia. Um, they, uh, the committee also, as you can see, uh, uh, went back to uh, uh, local Mexican uh, law, um, which uh, prohibited or, or uh, mandated that uh, uh, people uh, who were um, law violators, criminals, uh, could, were not supposed to be even allowed into the state. Um, so anyone previously convicted of a crime uh, under the Mexican law uh, could be thrown out of the state. Um, and so the Vigilance uh, Committee uh, also uh, started inspecting uh, or, or talking to people uh, in the community who might be uh, loitering or uh, causing problems of some sort and um, they uh, ordered uh, a number of people to leave. Um, the, uh, a lot of people just left. Uh, a lot of the criminals just left because they didn't uh, want to go through that. Uh, the threat essentially was leave or uh, you get something worse. Um, they uh, uh, again, arson was a big factor, and so they started uh, uh, patrolling the streets, uh, but they also uh, put up a, a $5,000 reward, which was a lot of money back then, uh, for the capture of anyone uh, who was then subsequently found guilty of arson. Um, they, uh, <clears throat> they set up a, a night watchman patrol system, mainly uh, to... Uh, reduce fires, uh, but also, of course, to uh, uh, watch for criminal activity. Um, the uh, uh, support was widespread in the community. Um, they, uh, they were clearly uh, in control of the community, or could have been, uh, but uh, the citizens were uh, behind them, uh, supporting them, uh, at least the law-abiding citizens. The only real significant opposition was from the uh, political powers in the city who, uh, of course, were losing control uh, and uh, influence. Um, the politicians actually lobbied the, the governor of the, uh, uh, was it a state or a territory at the time? I don't remember, but it, uh, he... Uh, bowed to their pressure and actually issued a uh, proclamation um, calling for people to unite against the, the vigilance uh, activities um, and aid the, uh, the public officials in restoring order uh, to the community. Um, of course, uh, the vigilante committee had already restored order. Uh, they just wanted uh, to get the power back into the hands of the politicians. Um, the, the day after that, uh, the committee uh, was uh, in the process of hanging two more uh, criminals, uh, and uh, the sheriff and, and some of his deputies um, arrived uh, with a warrant of habeas corpus uh, signed by the governor to take those two criminals uh, back uh, to the jail, um, the vigilante said no, uh, and 
uh, the sheriff and his deputies withdrew and you never heard from the governor again about the issue uh, because it was obvious that uh, uh, it wasn't going to be effective. Um, so uh, uh, they did uh, that uh, double hanging that was uh, uh, that the sheriff tried to stop. Um, but that was the last major act that they uh, did as a, a committee. Um, uh, you, the official numbers, and of course, uh, I'm sure that the unofficial numbers would be uh, uh, larger in some of these categories. Um, they hanged four people. Uh, they whipped one, uh, which wasn't all that uncommon at the time. They deported, officially deported 14 people to uh, Australia. They probably sent many more back than that. Um, they uh, uh, informally convinced uh, another 14 people to leave the city, and maybe they uh, did that to many others as well. Um, 15 of the people they arrested were actually turned over to the public uh, authorities, and uh, uh, 41 were officially discharged. Uh, found not guilty and, and let go. So um, what you have then is a record uh, of uh, some use of violence. They did hang four people and whip one. Uh, but a, a result that was uh, uh, really quite dramatic. Uh, uh, murder rates uh, fell uh, from uh, something uh, around a hundred uh, a, uh, a year to uh, two uh, during the period that they were in control. Uh, the number of fires fell dramatically. Um, uh, the town became quite uh, orderly and peaceful. Um, and so they were, in fact, uh, quite effective relative to what uh, the public law enforcement apparatus uh, had been doing before. <laughs> Nonetheless, they announced their, uh, uh, that they were ending their action um, and um, they uh, simply appointed a, a small committee to act as sort of a watchdog for the uh, public process. Um, it, they, that committee didn't do much. Uh, it took a couple of actions uh, in support of public city officials uh, but that was it. So uh, they uh, sprang up when uh, things were a mess uh, in terms of uh, crime and, and arson. Uh, they resolved the issue quite effectively and then they went away. Um, they probably went away too quick. Uh, the uh, uh, next vigilante <laughs> movement in San Francisco was only four years later. Um, the, uh, uh, the political apparatus in San Francisco grew dramatically um, following that episode, um, but it grew as a, uh, a sort of Tammany Hall kind of political machine, uh, lots of corruption, uh, lots of uh, um, city officials were committing crimes, uh, bribery, all those sorts of things were going on, uh, and very little was uh, being uh, uh, used for um, law enforcement. Um, as you can see, uh, between November 55 and May 56, there were more of a, uh, than 100 murders uh, in the city. Uh, so murder rates were back up to what they had been prior to the earlier movement. Um, one uh, particularly important uh, murder uh, occurred in uh, November of 1855 uh, when one of the politicians, uh, Charles Cora, uh, shot uh, and killed the U.S. Marshal. Um, uh, the Marshal was unarmed, so it was uh, clearly a, uh, a murder. Um, 
Cora was in fact arrested by the sheriff, but the sheriff and him were buddies, uh, and uh, uh, he had uh, support of of the local uh, political apparatus. Uh, some of the best lawyers in the city uh, uh, retained to defend him. Um, uh, they put him on trial, and he was uh, found uh, not guilty. Uh, Allegedly, the jury was fixed. Uh, it was, uh, um, there's evidence that the, they had, uh, before the trial, uh, the, the witnesses had been coached. Uh, uh, perjury uh, was uh, uh, clearly uh, evident in a number of the, uh, um, a lot of the testimony. Um, the uh, um, jury uh, almost unanimously voted to uh, not guilty, and he was released. Uh, the uh, San Francisco Herald uh, came out shortly after that calling for uh, a return to the good and vigorous days of the Vigilante Committee. Um, the uh, uh, Shortly thereafter, uh, Another murder occurred. Uh, this time, uh, it was a, a publisher of another San Francisco paper, The Bulletin. Um, he uh, had written a, an editorial kind of thing, uh, pointing out that one of the city supervisors uh, had a uh, criminal record that he'd spent time in uh, Sing Sing. And uh, so the response by that individual was uh, to confront uh, the, the publisher in the streets as he was walking home unarmed and shooting. Um, that night, the vigilante committee reformed. Uh, the uh, uh, citizenry was up in arms, a, you know, a group of what 10,000 or so gathered on the streets demanding action. Um, and uh, so you get a, a new vigilante committee uh, these uh, you, you can these are pictures actual picture this is a photograph that's a, a drawing um, of committee members you can see uh, that it's not a mob it's pretty well organized uh, uh, it looks more like a military group than a mob I guess um, they uh, reformed um, and uh, quickly uh, made uh, an arrest uh, for the individual that uh, shot the uh, publisher of the paper. Um, the, uh, um, I should say, uh, he'd ha he had been arrested by the sheriff, uh, but uh, they went to the jail and took him. Um, uh, they had a cannon, I don't know if you can see the cannon there in that picture, but they had a cannon out in front of the jail and said, if you don't give him to us, we're gonna uh, destroy the jail. Um, so they turned over uh, Casey, and uh, they also uh, got uh, took uh, Cora, the, the guy who had shot the marshal, um, and they con uh, convened a uh, court um, initially to uh, try Cora, uh, but uh, uh, that publisher who had been shot had not died uh, up to this point, but then he died, and so they put Casey on trial as well. Uh, so uh, both uh, were, uh, went through a vigilante trial. Uh, they were both found guilty uh, and sentenced to hang. Um, the, uh, uh, as one of the uh, historians writing about the period says, it, it wasn't a lynch mob. It, it was an organized... Uh, court uh, followed by a, an orderly uh, hanging. Um, the uh, defendants actually had uh, representation, uh, legal representation at the trial, uh, but uh, the jury decisions were, uh, were unanimous. And so they were hung um, on, uh, uh, outside the public buildings, uh, and um, the uh, things 
calm down, I guess you might say, after that. Um, the aftermath uh, was uh, uh, a, uh, similar to the previous one. Uh, the uh, committee did remain active for another three months, uh, but, uh, oh, this is, I'm sorry, I misled you. This is the time where the murder rate went from 100 down to 2. Um, the uh, uh, committee did uh, similar things to the previous committee in that they put some people on outbound ships and that sort of thing. Um, they did uh, hang two murderers uh, before they quit, uh, but uh, then uh, they uh, disbanded. Uh, despite the fact that uh, they had faced a, a lot bigger task than the uh, earlier committee had because they had to deal with not only uh, criminals in the sense of robbers and murderers, but with a, uh, an organized political uh, machine that included the sheriff and, and uh, a number of his deputies uh, and um, uh, the, uh, one of the judges and so on. Uh, but they uh, wrestled power away from the, that corrupt machine um, and uh, reestablished a, uh, a political order, and then they disband. Um, so uh, are these uh, people outside the law, or are they uh, enforcing the law? Uh, one historian says uh, they're clearly... Uh, an example of outlawry of violence in the West, um, and he couldn't understand how the public officials of the day could allow it even to organize. Uh, they didn't have much choice, in fact, of course. Um, the uh, uh, people uh, in the community, however, didn't see them as being outside the law. Uh, they were uh, reestablishing the law in the community, um, and um, that was their purpose. Once they did that, they disbanded. Um, those are, as I said, the two most uh, famous uh, vigilante movements in the West. There were many others, uh, uh, many of them in mining camps. Um, the uh, uh, really interesting book by uh, John McGrath, a UCLA historian, uh, does a detailed examination of a couple of the mining camps in California that had vigilante movements. Um, same story uh, that you could tell about uh, uh, the San Francisco vigilantes. Um, I'm going to uh, move away from California and go to my home state of Montana uh, for my last story. Um, this one, uh, uh, this movement occurred in the gold camps. Uh, first Bannock and then uh, Virginia City. Um, the, uh, and Nevada City as well. For us in cars, these are all very close together, but at the time they weren't necessarily close together. Um, this was more like the second uh, vigilante movement in San Francisco than the first one, uh, there was a lot of uh, robbery going on. Uh, Virginia City actually is the largest single placer um, mining discovery in the world. Uh, so lots of wealth was being generated and wealth attracts criminals. Uh, so there was a fair amount of criminal activity. Uh, but uh, uh, it uh, turns out that the public uh, official who was supposed to be dealing with it, uh, the sheriff, um, was actually the leader of the biggest of the criminal gangs. Uh, so they couldn't count on him. Uh, a little background on him. Henry Plummer, uh, he uh, came from Maine, in, in eight, uh, but uh, he moved to California in 1852. Uh, uh, Searching for gold, he was uh, one of the many thousands of teenagers that moved west. Uh, west was built by teenagers, by and large. Um, and uh, he uh, was very successful initially. He had a gold mine. He managed to buy a ranch. Um, he managed to 
uh, impress a lot of local people, uh, and he was actually elected sheriff um, of his uh, community. Actually, it was at the time, it was the third, third biggest city in, in California. Um, and he was reelected uh, again uh, in 1857. But shortly after that, uh, he killed someone. Uh, he had been carrying on an affair with uh, a married woman and the husband uh, confronted him about it, and uh, the husband ended up at, uh, uh, all the worse for it. He was killed. Um, and so Plummer was uh, arrested, charged, tried, convicted of second-degree murder, uh, and sentenced to 10 years in San Quentin prison. Um, he uh, only served uh, six months. Uh, there was a movement in the community uh, to uh, allow him uh, uh, to acquit him or uh, let him out. Uh, apparently, the argument was he had some health problems. Um, but uh, he did get out uh, for political reasons. Uh, shortly after that, he got into a fight over a prostitute this time, and he shot the other guy um, and was again arrested. Uh, he bribed his way out of prison uh, or out of jail and fled. Uh, he headed for Oregon. So uh, he left California with warrants uh, for his arrest. Um, he, uh, uh, that followed him to Oregon. Um, he moved then on to uh, uh, Idaho and was in uh, Lewiston, Idaho uh, by 1862. Um, there he met one of his San Quentin cellmates and they formed a, a, a gang and started robbing people in the area, uh, mine, uh, miners and, and uh, gold shipments. Um, but once again, he got himself uh, in hot water. He got in a fight uh, uh, and uh, was, uh, he, he ended up killing uh, a man that uh, the, he got in a fight in a bar, um, and the uh, saloon keeper uh, ran him out of the bar. Uh, unfortunately for the saloon keeper, he followed him out, and um, they got into a shootout, and uh, Plummer killed him. Uh, apparently, he was very handy with the gun. <laughs> um, so the violent, there was some violence in the West. <laughs> but, uh, uh, so he, once again, uh, flees, and this time he ends up in uh, Montana. He was in uh, Bannock, Montana, um, and Bannock was uh, a, a significant uh, gold strike. Um, lots of people moved in fairly quickly. Um, Plummer formed a, another gang there, um, who they called themselves the Innocents. Uh, the, the gang was so large, uh, had estimates of 100 members, and uh, so not everybody knew each other, uh, and so they had to be able to identify each other so they didn't uh, rob each other, and uh, so they developed a special handshake, and, and they had this phrase, uh, I am innocent, uh, would identify them to the other members of the gang, uh, and so they ended up being called the Innocents. Um, they uh, uh, committed robberies uh, over a wide area. One of, the, uh, one of their uh, uh, main uh, activities was uh, robbing stagecoaches. Uh, this uh, picture of that house, that's, uh, it's called Robber's Roost now. It was a, a stage stop and uh, members of the gang just kind of hung out there. Uh, and then when uh, a uh, stagecoach came through with a substantial amount of gold, uh, they'd go rob it. Uh, and uh, so uh, it, this house still exists. Um, the uh, 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 plumber uh, committed a, a, another uh, killing, uh, actually, in Bannock. Um, a, a, uh, an old enemy of his showed up in town, 
uh, and they were in a bar again, and, and the, this guy started uh, saying bad things about Plummer, um, and uh, Plummer uh, allegedly told him to stop, uh, but the guy continued, uh, and so uh, uh, some of the things he was saying were things like, well, Plummer led a gang in Lewiston, Idaho that was robbing people, and you know, things like that, that might, he might not have wanted uh, people in Bannock to know about. So uh, uh, they, uh, Plummer tried to get him to stop, uh, but he didn't. And, and so when Cleveland, uh, this guy pulled his own gun out, uh, Plummer shot him. Um, and the, it's important uh, to know what happened right after that. He, he was, uh, the guy didn't die immediately. He was taken to um, <clears throat> a uh, house that belonged to Hank Crawford. Um, uh, and Crawford, uh, he was a, uh, a butcher. Uh, I, I guess he knew something about anatomy, so they took him there. I don't know. Uh, uh, he uh, was uh, tending to this guy, and, and the guy just told him all the bad stuff about Plummer. So uh, Crawford knew uh, these stories about uh, uh, Plummer, uh, and this becomes important a little bit later because uh, in uh, the spring of 1863, uh, the community of Bannock decided that crime was getting out of hand and they needed a sheriff. And so they held an election uh, and, uh, the, uh, and uh, Crawford ran uh, for sheriff and Plummer ran against him uh, and uh, Crawford won. Um, so shortly after that, you won't be surprised to know that uh, uh, Plummer went after him. Um, uh, Crawford had been warned, so he uh, had a shotgun with him. And uh, when uh, Plummer uh, went after him, uh, Crawford shot him, uh, buckshot in his right arm. Uh, so the story is that Plummer then immediately went out and started practicing shooting with his left hand and uh, became quite proficient, uh, so that now he's, he can shoot with either hand. Um, and uh, when Crawford heard that he was doing this, uh, Crawford just took off. And so they held another election, and this time Plummer won. Uh, so now he's uh, uh, the sheriff uh, through uh, democratic means, uh, and uh, he appoints his own deputies, of course, including uh, uh, gang members. Um, he uh, managed to use some political influence actually to be appointed uh, the uh, deputy U.S. Marshal for the region as well. So he was essentially the law uh, enforcer of the region um, and uh, <coughs> simultaneously uh, leading the outlaw gang. Uh, so uh, crime wasn't declining at all. In fact, it was uh, increasing probably. Uh, so then in December of that year, you get uh, a vigilante movement, um, not just Bannock, but Virginia City and Nevada City as well. They organized uh, a, a group of vigilantes, uh, and this was a little more of a secret society, I guess you might say, than, than the San Francisco ones. Um, they, uh, uh, of course, the, the criminal element was quite large. Um, and uh, so if, you, if they knew for sure you were a member of the committee, uh, you probably were in considerable danger. And so they, they would wear masks and uh, visit these various outlaws uh, in the middle of the night and tell them to leave. Um, and uh, <clears throat> they uh, put up posters all over the area uh, telling uh, people to uh, who were part of the criminal gang to leave. Um, they uh, became more open, uh, I guess, uh, after some initial successes. And so they uh, uh, issued the, this vigilante oath that you probably can't read. Uh, and a number of them actually signed it. So you, you could uh, see who was involved. Um, the... Uh, they hung, ultimately, um, 24 outlaws. 
between December 63 and, and February 64. Um, the, uh, uh, one of the early ones that was hung, um, tried to talk his way out of it and tried to make a deal by telling him who the leader of the gang was. And so he told them it was Plummer. Um, and uh, so they sent uh, uh, a group of uh, a posse, I guess you call it, a, a fairly large one, uh, 50 or 75 people out. After Plummer, uh, they caught him um, and uh, uh, took him back to Bannock. Uh, he ends up being hung on the gallows he actually built as sheriff, uh, which was uh, sort of interesting uh, way to go out. Um, uh, legend is that he uh, uh, tried to buy his way out of it. Uh, he offered to, uh, $100,000 if they wouldn't uh, hang him, but uh, they hung him anyway. So um, the uh, result then um, is this gang of 100 or so uh, by early 1864 was gone. They were either dead, uh, about 24 of them, uh, or fled the area. Um, the uh, um, uh, committee, uh, uh, the crime didn't end with the elimination of this gang, of course. Uh, gold camps, especially really um, major strikes like Virginia City, attracted thousands of people, including uh, substantial numbers who were there to uh, mine the, po the pockets of other people. Uh, and so uh, there continued to be robberies and so on, and, and the vigilante committee continued to operate, um, hanging uh, another nine people um, after uh, February 64. Uh, the last hanging was in uh, October of that year. So um, the uh, uh, committee really didn't officially disband, uh, so there was sporadic sorts of activities for a while after that, uh, a couple of years probably. Um, but uh, uh, government came. Uh, Montana Territory was established in uh, May of 1864. Bannock was chosen as the capital. Um, it was at that time the most populated of the gold camps. Uh, when gold ran out of, uh, uh, however, the people did too, and so uh, Bannock uh, quickly died as a town, and then they moved the uh, capital to Virginia City, which was the next, uh, then the largest, uh, and it died, and they moved the capital to Helena. Uh, the, uh, uh, at, at that point, uh, when, anyway, when the territory was formed, uh, a... Uh, uh, an individual who was had a lot of uh, political con connections in Washington was actually appointed to be the first chief justice of the territory. Uh, and when he got there, he announced uh, that the vigilantes um, had served their purpose. Uh, and from that day on, um, vigilantes would be considered to be criminals. Uh, and uh, they actually established a a uh, uh, territorial court to try criminals. Uh, prior to that, there had not been a public court uh, of any uh, real uh, significance. They, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, they convinced Congress to give them some money to build a prison, um, to punish people, and so you start seeing the apparatus of, of uh, uh, criminal control uh, in the state developing. Um, and uh, so uh, now you have a, uh, an alternative to the vigilantes and uh, the uh, group uh, did disband then in 1867. Uh, they uh, uh, did, uh, there was a group of miners actually who um, threatened vigilante action, I guess, the, against the vigilantes if they didn't. Uh, you know, the, the idea was uh, we're 
we're becoming a, you know, we're a territory now. We need, uh, we need uh, law and order. We can't have this reputation of these uh, vigilantes running around uh, uh, chasing bad guys. Uh, we need the public police to do that. And so uh, the vigilante uh, organization uh, did disband. Um, the, uh, that wasn't the end of vigilantes in Montana, but it's about the end of my talk. Um, the, uh, uh, there was another vigilante group in Helena, uh, uh, started in 1865. Uh, there was a, a cattlemen's association uh, that uh, engaged in vigilante type activities in the 1880s. Um, so uh, the uh, result uh, was, uh, uh, or the vigilante movement it clearly didn't end at that point, but I will, as I said. Um, this is a picture of Bannock, Montana today. Um, you can imagine that at one point there were at least 10,000 people living there. Uh, so uh, it's uh, changed a little. Um, the, uh, I, I will say in closing that there is a revisionist history um, coming out uh, about some of the vigilante movements. Um, the uh, Montana vigilante uh, movement, the, the Bannock and Virginia City movement have been uh, challenged, the stories that I just told you. Um, the, uh, 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 these uh, revisionist historians, uh, some go so far as to say that it was the vigilantes themselves who uh, were committing uh, the robberies and not the sheriff and his gang. Uh, Plummer's background uh, sort of supports the idea that he might be a criminal, however, and, and the people uh, in the vigilante movement, uh, many of them were uh, very prominent citizens who ultimately went on to become senators and, and governors and uh, so, well, maybe they were the criminals I, when you think about it, but uh, <laughs> uh, they uh, um, uh, were, were really the upper um, crust uh, of the community. Um, uh, there is some evidence, of course, that uh, uh, some people who were uh, hung uh, were uh, innocent. Uh, if you read the papers, you know that occurs today as well. Uh, the, every state that has capital punishment has probably hung somebody that was innocent. Um, the, uh, uh, this one individual, the strongest evidence of somebody being hung who shouldn't probably have been hung is uh, this individual, uh, uh, Jack Slade. Um, he, was, uh, uh, he was a drunk. He was uh, a, a rabble rouser. Uh, he, he's a nice guy when he was sober, what, but when he was drunk, he'd pull his guns out and shoot in the air and, and uh, all sorts of problems like that. Um, he never hurt anyone, apparently, but uh, the city leaders of Virginia City uh, wanted uh, to create this image of a peaceful community again. Uh, and so uh, Slade just, they couldn't talk him out of uh, this bad behavior. He just kept doing it. Uh, and finally, uh, rumors started spreading uh, that he was a thief and a murderer. Um, probably not much evidence to support that, uh, but it was enough uh, so that the uh, vigilantes uh, took him out of town and, and hung him. Uh, so, uh, yeah, they made some mistakes, uh, no doubt. Uh, in all likelihood, the rest of the people they hung were guilty of what they were hung for, um, but you can always look back at, uh, at evidence and suggest uh, maybe it wasn't strong enough to justify a hanging. Um, I will say that these uh, revisionist historians uh, uh, have been uh, reviewed by uh, Montana historians, uh, a number of Montana historians, and uh, they don't buy the argument. They're very critical of the revisionist story. They, they believe the, um, the original story about uh, the vigilantes uh, arising to uh, reestablish order. Um, 
the uh, uh, the problem I would say with the the modern sort of view of vigilantes as as an example of lawlessness um, is uh, that it implies that uh, the public system um, is uh, the only system that uh, can uh, establish order. Um, um, and there's no recognition in this argument that, in fact, the public system might be inept or corrupt, uh, uh, ineffective in some way. Um, as uh, as my, one of my favorite economists says, uh, 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 Hayek, uh, the uh, allegiance on which this sovereignty rests really depends on the satis uh, sovereign satisfaction of expectations on the part of the general public. And so if the public, uh, the, the, the government, the sovereign fails, then the public has a responsibility uh, to rise up and uh, uh, change the situation. Um, the idea that government is paramount uh, gives much too much power uh, to that authority uh, and the idea of rising up against uh, bad government, uh, of course, has a long history in the United States going back to the revolution. Um, I would view these vigilante movements as uh, in that same tradition. Um, they rebelled against the king um, in, uh, in Bannock. They rebelled against the, uh, the sheriff. Um, it uh, did, doesn't mean lawlessness. It means uh, uh, establishing a new order. Uh, and uh, that's uh, what uh, virtually every vigilante movement that I've looked at in the West uh, was about.